welcome to our last session today. Uh, the next talk will be by Mikhail Lalach about um, small scale energy harvesting for self powering devices. Thank you, Mr. Chaman. Good afternoon, everyone. So, here, uh, the basic idea behind this uh, talk is actually a tutorial, uh, as it uh, has been uh, uh, announced in the program. And uh, be behind this, uh, there are two ideas. The first one is that I decided the, the choice I've made is not to provide you with recent progress and so on, but rather to give you some, um, some overviews and some insights in terms of uh, energy harvesting, globally speaking, uh, and uh, have some uh, kind of focus on circuit uh, aspects, uh, mainly for uh, piezoelectric and power electric systems. And uh, why I think it's also important to have this kind of overviews because uh, there are several uh, reasons for that. The first one is uh, previously we had some uh, discussion with either uh, potential industrial partners or potential academic collaborators and uh, we figured out that sometimes it's quite difficult to, uh, to give the right message and to get understood in terms of energy harvesting. I mean, when a ski company comes to see us and asks us to hit the shoes from the, uh, the vibrations of the ski, the difference in terms of energy levels is so high that, of course, it's impossible, but to, to have this kind of ideas in terms of energy balance, what can I get, how can I use it? And also, the, th the second uh, reason for that is that now, uh, doing energy harvesting for energy harvesting only, is uh, not something that uh, it's hardly uh, paying off. I mean, by experience, most of the project I got, it's not an energy harvesting itself. It's more global. It's on self-powered sensors. For example, going from the material to electrical aspect, including the structural considerations and so on. So that's why uh, I guess now it's very important to have this kind of global overview not to stick on only one field because when we uh, combine several blocks that are optimized independently, the global system is not optimized, of course, because here we have kind of bidirectional coupling. So that's the main motivations uh, behind this talk and uh, more precisely behind this tutorial. And uh, as any kind of course or tutorial, we have some uh, competencies and uh, know-how, knowledge, and what are the, these ones in this talk? Actually, the, uh, this talk has mainly two parts. The first one being dedicated to general consideration about energy harvesting. So that's uh, why uh, the associated objectives are to have some ideas about the potential energy sources and how to convert these sources into electricity. This is for energy harvesting, but then how to use this energy this would be the second consideration, how to uh, globally design the system in order to meet the energy balance. Uh, we cannot use any kind of uh, sensing uh, strategy according to the energy or the power that we can harvest. And then the second uh, aspect will focus more on uh, piezoelectric and pyroelectric energy harvesting, which is actually the core of uh, this conference with a uh, more particular focus on the electrical aspect in terms of, uh, for example, in terms of load adaptation, what can we use to ensure that we harvest most of the power, most of the energy, whatever the state of the connected load, load after, uh, how, to, uh, or how to model the transducer in order to, make, to be able to make some simulations, uh, and so on. So we will do both uh, some uh, quick theoretical analysis but if you agree with this, we can also do all together some uh, simulations. Uh, we'll uh, come back a little bit more uh, on this uh, later, actually on the next slide. Uh, this next slide will be the outline of the talk. So the first one, uh, the first part, which is the motivations behind energy harvesting and more generally self powered product. We had some uh, nice uh, overview on the last talk. And then uh, we'll go to the modeling, how we can model such system. Uh, I will go principally into uh, electrical uh, equivalent circuit, but we will see that because they are equivalent, uh, we can easily have some kind of sim simple model, of course, still simple uh, for non-minorities and so on. 
it's, it's a little bit difficult, but I mean for the first, uh, for the first approximation, that's uh, also something that can be useful in order to uh, design a system. Then we'll go to the circuit aspect uh, with uh, mainly two parts. The first part being the load, the load adaptation. So uh, how to ensure maximum power extraction. And then uh, I guess on this part I will maybe be a little bit quicker, the uh, energy extraction optimization, how to use non-linear circuit in order to enhance uh, the power that can be energy that can be extracted from the transducer. And then we'll go to a, a short summary at the end. So the, uh, this is mainly a tutorial, so I hope, the, I hope it will be uh, kind of interactive. And as a teacher, I often notice that, uh, that the students, actually, the, uh, let's say the time period for maximum concentration for the courses, it's seven minutes. So uh, then the students go to the smartphone, to the laptop, chatting each other. So here, only for two slides, but uh, I will encourage you to use your smartphone or the laptop. Because there will be some, uh, there will be, and hopefully it will work, uh, there will be uh, some quiz uh, all along the talk, uh, or two slides actually. And then uh, if you agree with it, I don't know if you would like we try to make all together a kind of simulation profile, either for the model or for the circuit, we can uh, do something with uh, LT Spice. It's uh, one of uh, the numerous uh, simulation software that are available. This one has the advantage of being free and the disadvantage of being provided by uh, IC manufacturer, so some IC are easier, so some IC, some uh, circuits are easier to find than the other ones, especially the one from the manufacturer, of course. It's much easier to find it for this, uh, this simulation software, but uh, it's still a quite nice tool for a quite simple uh, simulation. So first, uh, I would like to know if you can raise your hand if you want we do that all together or not. Okay, so we'll try, maybe we will go a little bit further, uh, we'll, uh, a little bit quicker on this part. So first, uh, I propose to go to a uh, short introduction. So why and how doing energy harvesting? So the first question is why, which has been uh, quite uh, nicely answered previously, actually. Uh, the, there are many uh, reasons. Uh, the first one is the huge increase in terms of autonomous uh, devices. When I say autonomous devices, it's not self-powered devices. There are big uh, difference between them. Autonomous devices, it's everything that we are uh, using, like uh, widespread sensing, like IoT, Internet of Things, and so on. And uh, so it's a little bit old, uh, a little bit old survey, but it's still quite relevant to see that Within a few years, we, have, we will have tens of, uh, tens of billions of connected devices worldwide. So that's a huge network, huge uh, sensing, uh, actuation, information network. And that will raise, of course, the issue of power supply for them. Meanwhile, uh, we, have some, we had some progresses in terms of microelectronic uh, component consumptions with that, uh, follow, that typically follows a Moore's law. Uh, you see it's a log scale here. And we can see that now it's possible to uh, perform a function, an electronic function, with very few energy. For example, we have uh, microcontrollers for uh, that consumes very low energy. As an example, a uh, Phoenix microcontroller that is now uh, four or five years old, I think. It's uh, 30 picowatt when it's in six states. So it's very, very small. Uh, However, we have the battery that are needed uh, to uh, power such systems, and the battery has some limitations. The first limitation is actually that the battery capacity uh, did, is one of the exceptions to the Moore's law. So that means that while when we are looking at that low scale, we had some, uh, for most of the characteristic of electronic components, it's kind of a low, uh, exponential increase there is kind of a saturation for the battery capacity. However, and especially recently, uh, there, were the, there has been kind of shift of, of paradigm for energy harvesting, where energy harvesting is not here to replace the initial energy that is stored in such batteries, because this initial energy is 
huge and is quite huge, it's still quite huge, huge and can be used for powering for years uh, sensors. But the main uh, limitation, the main motivation and explanation for the interest of energy harvesting nowadays is actually the self-discharge. So that means that the energy is lost without being even used. And this is even more true when we are facing quite uh, severe environments. For example, here we have the remaining capacity of batteries as a function of the temperature. And you can see even at uh, 60, degrees, uh, 60 degrees C, which is not that high, we are, we are losing more than, more than half of the initial energy within one year. And how to, uh, how to address this issue, actually? Well, actually, uh, it's a matter of energy. But if we are looking around us, we, have, we are surrounded of energy. Either when I'm moving, when we have a temperature change, when we go out a building or entering a building uh, during summer or winter, things like this. Uh, maybe also the, some magnetic energy around us, things like this. So that means that if we can use uh, such sources to power up our sensor, it's quite nice. Again, here the idea is not to supply the tens of billions of devices because not, of all, not all of them uh, can be eligible for, eligible for energy harvesting and self-powering. It depends on the energy level. Okay, so uh, only a few parts uh, of this uh, possibility can actually be uh, considered for energy harvesting. And if we are looking at this Work now. We check. If we are looking at these possibilities, I would like to have uh, your opinion about this. And for you, what would be the suitable energy sources for energy harvesting? And we can discuss a little bit around what you propose. So you can connect on this uh, website and give your uh, your opinion about about what are the possible energy sources that we can have around us that we can actually use for energy harvesting and more precisely I would say uh, small scale energy harvesting. So of course there are many possible energy, there are not only one uh, right answer and uh, we can consider several things. So uh, indeed there are vibrations, so they are basically mechanical energy. Uh, we will see it a little bit later. What I want to do here if, is first to make some uh, a kind of a list to see if what I'm saying after is uh, relevant or not. Hopefully it is. Sunlight. Sunlight, there is something that is quite funny about it, is that uh, a few years ago we got, uh, we got collaboration with an industrial partner that was kind of uh, giving some equipment for uh, container, for air aircraft containers. You know what you see on the in the airports where your luggage is sometimes put and lost sometimes also, uh, things like this. Because actually the, the company, uh, the, the plane company, they don't know where uh, their containers are. Uh, they are losing a huge amount of them and they want to have kind of tracking system. So what uh, these people proposed is to make some uh, self-powered system in order to uh, follow Tracking, we just put it in world cloud, that would be maybe nicer. Okay. So he wanted to make something that was able, that make the companies able to track their containers, and he wanted to make it uh, self powered, so powered by ambient sensors in order to, uh, to, uh, to not to use uh, batteries. And the first thing, of course, he considers is he considered is solar. But what was the main issue is that solar, you need to put it outside of the container, and mainly and very high, he was facing some uh, people stealing it. So that's why at the end, he didn't want to go to solar. So just a uh, thing to say that, uh, uh, to say that when we are designing a self port system, of course, there is a scientific aspect, but there is also the socio-economical aspect. So, if I go back to what you answered, so first of all, thank you very much for uh, your participation. We can see that we have uh, that we we have 
many uh, possibilities. And globally speaking, I see three, and I will explain later why, why WIMB, I put it with, with in a, I'm including it in another one, but uh, three uh, possibilities. Actually, when I'm preparing the slides, these slides, uh, on my side, I've been seeing four of them. As you said, thermal energy is one of them. Actually, thermal energy can be seen as the primary energy source because whatever we are doing, we are producing heat. And we can consider thermal energy into two possible forms. The first one being a temperature difference in terms of space, so that's thermal gradient. The second possibility is a variation in terms of time. For example, when I'm uh, going from outside in the winter to inside the building with heating system, things like this. Uh, whatever the considerate case, actually, we have the energy that is actually exchanged is very huge. If I want to change uh, kind of a small volume of air of one degree C, actually the amount of associated energy to change this temperature is very important. But the main issue is that even without considering the transducing system, we have a limit that is the Carnot limit. And this Carnot limit can be very, very small, uh, especially when the difference between the hot and cold temperature is quite small. So we, we have intrinsic, uh, I would say, theoretical limit, uh, without even, even without considering the transducing system, uh, that limits actually the possibility of, thermal, uh, of using thermal energy. In other words, thermal energy it has high initial energy, potential energy, but it's very difficult to convert it. Then, also as you said, there are the vibrations, uh, which, is, which are also quite widely available. And also the vibration, we can find it in many, many forms, uh, from big structure like civil infrastructure to micro systems. So uh, it's uh, quite, uh, also quite general uh, source with uh, typical data that are the uh, vibration frequency vibration acceleration or vibration magnitude. Consider uh, when we are, cons according to how we are bonding the system, the transducer. And the power densities, they are also uh, in the range of, uh, let's say, a few milliwatts per cubic centimeters. The thing here is that in terms of availability, is it easy to find this source? Where is this uh, source uh, sustainable or not? It's really depending on the structure, whether we are considering uh, AC motor that is rotating uh, 24 hours a day or just uh, a road with uh, more, or less, uh, more or less frequent uh, utilization and so on. The third one that you also proposed are the radiations, either from the sun, so uh, the solar energy, that is also widely available, but that strongly depends on the conditions, uh, whether, for example, it's sunny or cloudy, or if you are indoor or outdoor, which leads to a very uh, wide range of, uh, of power density. And I've seen that someone uh, or several people proposed wind. Wind, that's true that we are converting mechanical energy, but initially, wind is actually from solar energy because the sun is hitting some part of, uh, of, uh, of the of earth. And so that's why we have this kind of movement of air that is the wind. So that's why uh, I'm not, I, be, uh, I think wind should be associated with solar. But of course, first, we have uh, a given uh, in input uh, energy of the wind uh, that will depend on the, uh, on the wind speed, the area, and so on. Uh, area should be here. I uh, don't know what happened with the arrow. Anyway. And secondly, once we have this input energy, we have to convert it uh, mechanically. And again, here we have a theoretical limit, which is the bet limit, uh, where uh, that uh, makes that, that says that we cannot convert more than 60% of the incoming wind energy. Uh, sorry, there is also uh, electromagnetic energy with radio frequency. However, we have to keep in mind that when we are using the phone, we don't want to send energy to uh, the people we are talking to, but we want to send information. 
So it's mostly signals rather than power. Of course, in the real world, we need some few power for the signal, but basically, because we want to send signal, we, there is no power issues except the losses behind, and we have very low energy density. It's typically SPA, and also the thing is that when we are going far from the antenna, the surface power is actually, the, uh, is actually decreasing uh, quadratically with the distance. So that means we have very few input power uh, with the radio frequency, especially with uh, Wi-Fi or communications. And finally, something I didn't find, but I think it's also quite interesting to consider, it's the biological source. For example, uh, it's very difficult to see it here, but uh, if you are eating uh, two, uh, a little bit more than 200 uh, Big, Mac, Big Macs, that you can drive a car, it's the energy for driving a car for uh, 88 miles. So also the energy is very huge uh, in, the, in foods, it's typically what you can find, uh, what you can find in the nutrition facts uh, when you are looking at, for example, the candy bar. You are, if you are eating a candy bar, just like the, just look at the nutrition facts. The energy is very huge. It's typically the chemical potential chemical energy that we can uh, actually use, but we will see it's also quite difficult to convert. On a more, um, I would say, on a more scientific way, this is where we can put, for example, some uh, bacterial fuel, fuel cells. So, if I'm trying to compare these uh, energies with several criteria, of course the power density, uh, the flow type, is it easy to get in a DC or is it AC uh, flow type or discontinuous flow type. Here we want to make systems quite small because we want to, uh, to power some uh, small scale sensors, so the energy should be easy to get at small scale. Is the source uh, always here, or for example, in the case of solar, some, uh, when it's sunny, it's good, but uh, if, there is some, uh, it's, it's, uh, if there is some cloud, it's a little bit difficult to get it. And finally, the availability, uh, globally speaking. And when we are doing like this, we can see that there are one, uh, two, three, uh, four uh, sources that are quite interesting, that are the thermal gradient, vibration, solar, and biological. The problem of radio frequency is that the power density is very, very small, as we discussed, because it's mainly signal. Uh, and, uh, and for the other ones, there are some criteria that could be quite uh, limiting factors. So now what we have seen here are the source, but the source are not the electrical power I can harvest. Then when I have this source, I have to convert it into energy, electrical energy. So we have also to think about the conversion effect, to think about the transducer. And so if I'm going back to these uh, four kind of sources, how can I convert it? So in terms of thermal, if I'm considering thermal gradient, I can use typically thermoelectric module. And this uh, transducing system is a very good example to show that between the potential source of the energy and the actual electrical energy I can harvest, it's very different. Because here, thermoelectric module that are more or less defined by the figure of mu ZT in terms of material, they suffer from a big, big drawback. That is that they, are, they have a very high thermal conductivity. That means if I'm putting it, if I, for example, uh, some people, they say, well, my, the skin is typically at uh, 30 degrees. Outside, it's uh, usually around 20, 25 degrees. That's great, I can have up to 10 degrees uh, of uh, thermal gradient. That's, that's not because we have 10 degrees of thermal gradient, that we, ha we will have 10 degrees of thermal gradient within our structure, within our thermoelectric module. Because we have also the uh, superficial exchange with uh, convection and so on. And at the end, when we have uh, 10 degrees of temperature difference, Without any uh, heat exchanger, we have 0 0.1 degree in thermoelectric module. So you see, in that case, that uh, it's very difficult to let energy entering within the transducing system. So that's one of the big limiting factors of thermoelectric modules. And that's why also, when you tell you where you can find some tiny 
very tiny uh, thermoelectric modules, but with very big fans, actually, or very big uh, heat sinks, because we need to, uh, to, ensure that, uh, to ensure that we have a significant thermal gradient here. When I'm considering temperature tandem and variation, which are maybe a little bit more difficult to find that, that, uh, that, uh, that thermal gradient, but we can still find in some application, we can consider pyroelectric materials. Okay, pyroelectric materials, you know it. You, you probably know it uh, better than me. So they are basically ferroelectric materials, uh, dielectric materials, kind of dielectric materials defined by their Curie temperature. And in terms of, uh, uh, of energy harvesting and energy conversion, because I totally agree that uh, it's not directly related to energy harvesting, but rather energy conversion, we have the coupling coefficient. Then in terms of vibrations, we have kind of active conversion effects, so we don't need to, uh, to provide initial energy to it that are the electromagnetic system and the piezoelectric system. So electromagnetic system, through the lens law, it's more uh, dependent on the velocity. And for the piezoelectric system, we are more something that is uh, related to the strain or the stress. But both of them are typically uh, working well in dynamic excitations. And again, like uh, piezoelectric material, one of the key factors, not directly related to energy harvesting, but more in terms of conversion, is uh, the electromechanical coupling. Then still in terms of vibration, we have uh, what I call passive because we need to provide some magnetization on, or some polarization. So that means that we need to provide initial uh, electrical energy in order to harvest more at the end. We have electrostatic system that can be quite uh, integrated and also electrostructive or magnetostructive system where we need to put a bias in order to activate the energy conversion mechanism. Then in terms of radiations, for the sun we have of course the photovoltaic uh, systems which is quite limited, which is, which is limited in terms of, band, uh, of efficiencies with uh, single junction being limited at uh, around 25, uh, 30% but now we are well above the theoretical limit when using heterogeneous junction cells, but still we, uh, we have some, uh, some losses in between. And uh, in terms of uh, wind, or more generally fluidic energy harvesting, we have also first the, uh, the energy conversion of the wind itself, which is through mechanical energy, and then mechanical into electrical. So we have the first stage, but also the second stage that is actually related to vibration energy harvesting. And finally, in terms of RF and magnetoelectric system, we can, for example, in RF, consider a simple ante antenna. An antenna is able to convert, if well-tuned, almost all the incoming energy that the antenna sees. But because this energy is very small, at, uh, when we are fixing the dimensions, uh, at the end we have something that is also quite small. And finally, the biological, uh, the biological source, so again, we here it's uh, chemical. It's basically uh, chemical uh, potential energy, and one we can use is actually redox reactions. So we have still quite limited efficiency here. And you see, if uh, you want to pour your watch, uh, for example, before Christmas, you can take two lobsters. You need two lobsters to, to uh, give enough power to your watch to uh, to work. So you see that the energy conversion is also quite small, even if the potential chemical energy is quite huge. So again, I'm uh, taking uh, this kind of uh, radar graph here, uh, but for the effects this time, with the criteria being the coupling, uh, how much entering energy I can convert into electrical energy. Is it easily to integrate? Because again, what we want to do is go into small scale system. Do I need to provide uh, initial bias either to polarization for electrical system or magnetization for magnetic system? Is it easy to interface with uh, uh, electrical circuits? And is it easy to interface with the structure? For example, if I'm taking the thermal gradient with uh, the thermoelectric module, it's very difficult to interface with the structure because as we discussed, there is a very high thermal conductivity. 
And it's also quite difficult to interface, uh, electrically speaking, because the output uh, voltage is quite small. Okay, it's typically less than uh, 100 millivolts when we are speaking about temperature difference of uh, tens of degrees. And when I'm doing uh, the same analysis, for example, for thermal, uh, so time domain coupling uh, for with, uh, with a pyroelectric system, for vibration, considering is an active uh, conversion with piezoelectric and, and uh, electromagnetic system, or passive one with electrostatic, electroswitching, and many magnetoswitching effects. With uh, photovoltaic cells, actually here, I guess, with the uh, progresses in heterojunction, the coupling should be a little bit more now. Uh, the wind, uh, and more generally, Big sources, radio frequency and uh, biological. Actually, at the end, at the end, uh, we can see that we have thermal uh, gradient that can be quite interesting, even if the interfacing could be can be a little bit difficult. Uh, the active uh, active method for vibration energy conversion, uh, solar, still quite interesting, uh, and uh, here we have. RF, because antenna can convert most of the incoming energy. Again, here I'm considering only the conversion, not considering the source, because at the end, when we combine this, con this uh, graph with the one of the source, we have kind of general comparison of energy harvesting systems. This is what I'm doing here, with the criteria being, being the source quality, to have a source that is easy to get with high, uh, pro, uh, with high power density, with power density being uh, also another criteria. Is it easy to integrate, to dispose it at small scale? Can I, is it easy to interface, either in terms of electrical interfacing, but also in terms of interfacing with the structure, either thermal structure, or uh, thermal energy harvesting, or mechanical structure for harvesting from, from vibrations, for example. Then we have, uh, three other kind of uh, socio-economical considerations. The cost, because at the end, if uh, the cost is much higher than the cost of, uh, of a chemical conventional battery, it could be difficult to sell. What I call energy amortization. What I call energy amortization is something I think is also very important. Uh, I will take an example for this. Uh, actually, Ten years ago, the French government gave a lot of money to people to put some solar cells, saying, oh, it's, uh, uh, it's, environmental, it's environment friendly, it's very ecologic, we have to do something for the planet, and so on. But at that time, the life, the life span of uh, photovoltaic cells was somewhere something like, I guess, uh, 12 years, while the uh, energy, uh, the time required to uh, have the same energy than the energy used to fabricate, transport, and uh, etc. Et the cells were 15, was 15 years. So that means during his whole lifetime, the energy, the total energy harvested by the photovoltaic cells was less than the initial uh, energy that was used for its fabrication, uh, installation, transportation, and so on. So actually, it was definitely not eco-friendly. It, uh, it was something that was used, uh, that was manipulating people just to try to uh, boost French economy. And at the end, they didn't manage to do it uh, for the photovoltaic cells. So this is what I call energy amortization. That means, will it be easy to harvest more energy than the energy uh, that I initially used to fabricate the whole device, and also taking account, for example, transportation and so on. Of course, some of these criteria here, they are very worth estimations, and most of them, actually, we can have long, uh, long discussions about them. And this is something I hope to, uh, that can be triggered by this uh, presentation. And uh, finally, IGing, that means can I uh, count on the, uh, on the transducing effect or the wall structure to work from, for tens of years, for example. And so when we combine both this uh, energy source and this uh, energy conversion effect, we can see that generally speaking, I will go come back a little bit just after on this generally, 
we have uh, the typical energy sources and, and uh, energy conversion effect of interest that are the thermal that are thermal gradients, vibrations using active effects and solars. But of course, this is very important to note that it's general consideration. Most of the time, what will guide through the process of source and effect selection will be the application. If I'm somewhere where there, uh, that is confined indoor without any uh, external uh, sunlight, of course I won't go to solar. Uh, if I don't have any of these resources that are directly available, I should go to another one. So again, this is some general consideration and uh, the choice of energy harvesting sources and conversion effect should be mainly guided by the applications. So anyway, now I have been able to select an energy source, convert it into electricity. What can I, what can I do with this energy uh, that has been uh, harvested? But first, let's do a short, because sometimes I have very big surprise about it. Let's do some uh, short survey. Is that for you? What are the typical power levels that we can have for energy or that are that we are playing with in uh, energy harvesting and self-powered systems. So we have, for example, milliwatts. So uh, milliwatts, we are always speaking about to have some uh, milliwatts, but we are gen generally speaking uh, milliwatts when we are talking about power density. So milliwatts per cubic centimeters, milliwatts per uh, squared centimeters at best. So. <coughs> When I'm going back to the milliwatts per cubic centimeters, usually I'm going to something I know a little bit more than the other. That doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that uh, I know it well, but when we are using piezoelectric uh, beams, cantilever beam, uh, things like this, the thickness of the piezoelectric materials is uh, hundreds of micrometers. So then if you take into account that we have milliwatts per cubic centimeters with thickness of, of hundreds of micrometers. That's quite huge area when we want to pour a tiny sensor that is uh, big like uh, my nail. So milliwatts, uh, it's possible, of course, but it starts being quite big micro generator, okay? I will take a definition of micro generator that was given to me by one of my former PhD students so during her defense, one of the committee members asked her, what does it mean for you, micro-generator? She, she replied, it's something with a size of few centimeters, but that can deliver micro-watts. So the micro-generators for her was not the size, it was the power that can deliver. Actually, that's not that far from that. It was for joking, of course, but it was kind of, uh, <clears throat> kind, kind of true at the end. Because uh, indeed, what we are dealing in terms of average of uh, generated power and average consumed power is more like 10 to 100 microwatts. When we are dealing with few hundreds of microwatts, we can start thinking the way things in terms of pouring sensors. The milliwatts, I would say that it's when the sensor is operating, but it's not really compatible with uh, energy harvesting. So that means we need to operate our sensor, not, not always, of course. We need to have kind of very long sleep, uh, sleep states when we might be less than microwatts, and then having kind of short time operations, sensing and then sending communication that can consume, so let's say, tens of milliwatts. So if we do the average, uh, as most of, uh, of you uh, answered, we are in the range of 10, to hundreds of microwatts. So that's why we have to be careful with the energy that we, uh, that we have uh, at our disposal. That means <coughs> when I ha harvest hundreds of microwatts, I, can, uh, I cannot do wh whatever I want, and I have to ver be, very to be very careful with the way I'm designing the system. And more particularly, uh, when designing the system, we have to be careful that there is a lot of bi-directional coupling. 
another explanation of well, another another thing about the fact that the coupling coefficient is not the uh, is not the uh, uh, very accurate factor for energy harvesting in terms of vibrations is that when I take energy, mechanical energy from my structure to convert it into electrical energy, there is less mechanical energy on my structure because I took some of it. And therefore, that means there is less energy actually entering my, uh, my structure. So that means if I harvest too much, I'm killing the sources and then I cannot harvest uh, enough. So that's why here between the structure and the energy conversion, we have this kind of structure modification in terms of entering energy. And if I want to take most of the energy at the end, I will have no energy for further use. So that's why you have to be careful with this. Okay. The same in terms of electrical energy. So here I have extracted energy and then I, I harvest it. If I harvest too much at the end, I will uh, have lower efficiency than if I leave a little bit of energy within my trans or on my transducer. So that's why I'm saying that it's very important to have this global aspect because if, for example, I'm optimizing the material, that doesn't mean that my whole self product system or my whole microgenerator will be optimized. The second thing in terms of sensing strategies, it's to be careful and to stick to what you really need. If you need to have, uh, let's say, uh, temperature resolution of 0 0.5 degrees C, it's useless to go to 0 0.05 degrees C at the end. It's uh, either, even counterproductive because as I'm uh, having better and better resolution, I'm using more and more energy. So it's very important to stick what is asked by the application or by the customer and uh, not trying to over-design the system. Another part is sensing and actuation. Sensing, as I said already for, uh, like for uh, communication, is that when we are doing sensing, it's mainly reading a signal. There is no particular power associated to it. So there is not, no power flow like in actuation when I need to convert part of the energy. Okay, so that's why sensing is more uh, is more realistic for energy harvesting rather than actuation. So that's why uh, here, even if we are looking at uh, particular, in particular, the energy, uh, the uh, electrical, uh, the electrical interfaces for energy extraction, it's very important to have good ideas of this in order to uh, globally design in a good way the system. So when even when we are doing the design of the electrical circuit, we have to keep in mind that it might, uh, it might uh, change uh, the way the structure is behaving. Also, when we are doing within our circuit, to uh, keep in mind that we shouldn't take too much energy because it would kill the source at the end. So this is uh, the end of this first part uh, of the talk about the general considerations and some uh, analysis of source and uh, energy conversion effect. Because if the end of the first part, if you want, we can have short discussion about it. Or if it's okay for you, we can continue, okay? So, <clears throat> before trying to design the electrical interface, we have to know about our sensor and uh, our transducer. So we need to have, let's say, a simple but, st but still a realistic and relevant model of it. So that's why it's important to well understand the modeling and, uh, and to implement it in an efficient way. Again, because we need this kind of co-design of the material, of the structure, and of the electrical interface, we need to find ways of making some for example, some, uh, some common simulations. Unfortunately, when we want to do some common simulation, except uh, even when you're considering, for example, finite elements, there is no software, uh, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, that combines both the source, the structure, the material, 
the uh, and the electrical aspect. So, if we want to make really uh, really precise uh, modeling of the world system, it's really huge. So that's why we need to simplify our system and to model, for example, our transducer uh, in uh, as, as, as simple as possible, but still with uh, relevant uh, behavior. So in our case, because uh, mainly because of the topic of the conference, we mainly uh, consider a vibrational system made of piezoelectric elements and uh, thermal systems made of power electric modules. And uh, so uh, this is uh, following what I've been uh, speaking about. What we will do is, because here what we want to focus on is the electrical aspect, will also try to make a model in the electrical domain. So if I'm starting with the piezoelectric systems, I'm uh, considering the linearized constitutive equations at local level, so with the electric displacement, permittivity, electric field, and so on, uh, stress, strain, uh, rigidity, and uh, piezoelectric uh, factor. Actually, if I'm looking at the electric displacement, just uh, here, when I'm doing, so here this is at the local level, so at the material level, and I want something at the circuit level. So first there is a difference in terms of scale. Here, I'm typically, let's say, in the micro meter scale, and I want something uh, at a mac uh, macroscopic scale. Here, uh, I'm dealing with uh, coulomb per, uh, per square meter, I want to deal with amperes. I'm dealing with uh, volt per meter, I want to deal with volt. So what I want to do is starting with this equation, going to something that is macros that is more macroscopic. And when doing this, actually, the electric displacement is related to the charge. So when I derive it, I have the outgoing current. Permittivity becomes cap uh, capacitor. The, str uh, the strain becomes the displacement, but because I've been deriving the charge it turns to a velocity. And finally, the stress becomes a force. So then I have already something I can more or less use because among the two microscopic equations uh, I have, one is already electric. The, uh, the next step would be how to implement the mechanical uh, model into uh, electrical domain. But first, let's uh, think a little bit about the meaning of this system. So if I'm looking at into a global system, so not only with the transducer, but with an equivalent mass, a dynamic mass uh, spring and so on, for example, when I'm putting it on a cantilever beam, I have at the end an uh, equation set that actually relates the electromechanical behavior of my system because I have an electrical equation uh, an electrical equation with the current and the voltage, but that makes intervening uh, a mechanical quantity. The same here, I have a mechanical equation, so uh, spring mass damper system, but with an excitation that is the well, part of the excitation that depends on an electrical quantity. So at the end, I can try to use this global, and of course, when we are speaking about global, that means we have some uh, assumptions. So here, that's why with this global lumped model, uh, there are still some limitations. But still, it's a quite uh, useful uh, tool, uh, simple tool, but still quite relevant under the considering uh, hypothesis. And we'll see how to implement it uh, for a global approach. So if I'm uh, trying to do some uh, some uh, uh, some consideration between mechanical and electrical systems because what I want to do from this equation is going to the electrical aspect. So uh, here basically both of them there are second order systems and if I'm looking at the, uh, the equation set of both of them I can see that there are a lot of similarities with uh, the displacement being played here by the electrical charge, the force being the voltage, the mass in terms of parameter, the mass coming uh, being no the inductance, the uh, damping coefficient being the resistance, both of them 
that uh, reflect losses. And finally, the, the stiffness that is uh, equivalent to uh, inverse of capacitance. So this is uh, equivalent circuit. Uh, equivalent circuit, they can be useful when we are doing some designs and more precisely when we are doing some simulations because I can also here trying to do the a mechanical equivalent of this electrical circuit but because here what we want to do is there are the electrical interface so we are more going into the electrical domain but still uh, one has to be careful when using it because at the end uh, we are kind of losing the physical meaning okay but uh, still again it's quite uh, it's quite a useful tool especially for simulation uh, we can find also this analogy when we are con considering the uh, energy. Kinetic energy in the mechanical domain, it's related to uh, the square of the mass and the square velocity. If I'm looking at, in the electrical domain, the kinetic energy is the energy in the inductance, and we find again the similarity between the mass and the inductance, and the displacement and the electrical charge, and the same with, for example, here the electrostatic energy, that is nothing else than potential energy in the electrical domain, with uh, what we have in the mechanical domain, with the spring energy. So this is what I was saying. At the end, the displacement is equivalent to an electrical charge. So that means that the velocity is equivalent to a current. A force is equivalent to a voltage. Mass becomes an inductance, stiffness, uh, inverse capacitance, and uh, damping coefficient becomes a resistance. So starting from this, we already have the beginning of our, of, uh, our mechanical equation. But what happened here is that we have also a term that is coupled in the uh, mechanical way. How to, uh, what can we use to reflect this coupling? Actually, it's conversion, and in conversion, we can find a synonym that is a transformation, and so we can use a transformer, an electrical transformer. And like this, we have a global system that is purely represented in the electrical domain, and that's still, that is still an uh, um, electromechanical system, but because we are considering that the branch uh, here can be is the mechanical branch that can be uh, represented by uh, by uh, the electrical equivalent component. We can do the simulation in a pure electrical simulation software. Of course, at the end, what we can do is to get rid of this transformer, and what we find back is the typical representation uh, of uh, some resonator with the current capacitance and the motional branch. Actually, the motional branch is what we have here with a factor uh, that uh, represents the, the energy conversion through the transformer. Okay? So here, this is something that can, in terms, in the view of energy harvesting, this is something that is important when we are dealing with highly coupled system. Because with highly coupled system, we take large amount of the available mechanical energy that leads to a reduced amount, amount at the end of the uh, available mechanical energy. But if the system has a very small coupling, of course, taking a little bit of uh, energy won't have significant impact on the system. So at the end, the mechanical behavior won't be changed a lot. We'll keep the same displacement, whatever uh, the amount of energy we are extracting. And at the end, we can just consider, in this particular case of very low coupling, we can just consider at the end uh, the, uh, only the electrical equation where we have a uh, current source with uh, internal impedance being, being the capacitance. I can also consider having several piezos. So that means several conversions. So I add in series because the force are adding up and so, in terms of, um, of electrical, uh, electrical aspect, the voltage are adding up. So I have several piezo. And also, considering extend this model to several modes. I, I can consider, for example, the first, second, third bending modes. And in order to see these modes, actually, 
I consider that the modes are not uh, dependent. They are independent between them. And I just, uh, I'm just adding the uh, representative mechanical branch of this mode. And at the end, I can have a quite simple uh, way uh, in terms of matrix to represent it. With here, uh, M, C, and K being the mechanical matrices for each mode uh, that represent with, that are di diagonal matrices with each term being each mode. The voltage with alpha being the, so the force factor that, are, that is linking the mechanical and the electrical domain. And also here, uh, the capacitance is actually only dependent on the number of piezo. And at the end, I can have the total displacement that is more or less the sum of all the displacement of each mode. Okay, so here I can also quite simply represent, uh, represent the global response of a global system, of course, under some uh, assumptions, for example, linear behavior, uh, things like this, uh, mode uh, independency, but it's quite simple, but still a uh, useful and relevant tool when we are considering the electrical interface. So, uh, for example, here it's uh, the implementation uh, on the uh, simulation software. So, uh, I don't know if we have a lot of time for it, but uh, from what I understood at the beginning of the talk, you are not, <laughs> not interested in doing this. Just a few things. Uh, here, for example, we can use such parameters uh, and be careful that when I'm considering the uh, capacitance, equivalent capacitance of the mechanical uh, branch, I have to invert it. And the second thing is that while previously I've been using a transformer, sometimes it's much more easier, much more stable uh, to use kind of uh, controlled voltage or current source. You can see here I'm controlling this current source according to the current that is flowing out, that is flowing in uh, the uh, resistance, okay? And if we are looking at uh, the, the link between the current, here, between the current and the displacement, actually, this is the velocity, which is totally consistent with what we have here. So we have, indeed, a uh, current source that is controlled by the, uh, by the velocity the velocity being the current through the mechanical branch. And again, if I'm looking at the other controlled source, in this case, it's a, it's a voltage source. And we can see that the voltage here, and uh, if we remember what we said, the voltage in the mechanical branch represents the force. And this voltage is no, nothing else than the output voltage of transducer. So in summary, what we have here is our mechanical branch with the electromechanical coupling, sorry. And here we have the electrical branch with the electromechanical coupling. And like this, I have a model. So here it's one mode, one piezoelectric element. I have a simple yet uh, useful model in order to have an idea of the behavior of my structure when I will connect my electrical interface after. Okay. If I'm going to power electric uh, systems, so again we have something that uh, that is good uh, that has some uh, local constitutive equations, uh, except that here we have the temperature. The difference is also what is nice with power electric system is that uh, it's uh, in terms of. The temperature, it's a scalar value, it's not a tensor, so sometimes it's easier to work with. Uh, but what is uh, a little bit more difficult is here for the uh, uh, thermal capacitance, we have the effect of the temperature also. But again, if I'm considering small scale uh, and small violation, I can consider that I'm in a linear, linear uh, behavior, and I can do also what I did previously. And considering that usually uh, power electric elements have quite low coupling, so that means the harvesting energy doesn't have a lot of effect on the entropy, 
I can neglect the thermal aspect, okay, and just consider uh, the electrical aspect. But again, I can still consider the thermal aspect, for example, with lumped model that can be that can be also uh, considered that can be implemented as equivalent uh, electrical sources uh, with, for example, resistance uh, conduction resistance or uh, resistance or thermal conduction resistance. Uh, calorific capacitance and so on. So I can also represent it in the uh, electrical domain. So again, we, in this case, we have the same than the piezoelectric case with low coupling. So uh, with uh, the current source, but, in the, but here the current source depends on the time domain variation of the temperature. So you can see that here, parametric element, this is what we said at the beginning, it's interesting, it's interesting for time domain variation of temperature, but for thermal gradients, because the current source uh, depends on the derivative of the temperature. So we have now uh, the tools in order to, uh, to see what happens when we are doing uh, our design. So now I will show you the next plot, uh, the electrical circuits themselves, with the first one being load, op load optimization. So, if I start with the, uh, in the power of piezoelectric case, I'm considering my transducer and I'm just putting a simple resistive load after. So that means no rectification, the signal is directly transmitted to the load. And then um, starting from uh, my extra equation, I'm, I'm going to the frequency domain. Okay, so it's this equation is just this one, but expressed in the frequency domain. Then, because I have because I have a resistance, I can also give through this resistance a link between uh, the current and the voltage. So at the end, I can have an idea of the voltage as a function, for example, the displacement or the temperature. And if I, and uh, then I can compute. The power associated with uh, the power associated with uh, this uh, connection across the load because this is where we want to use the power. It's the load, and if we plot it, we can see that we have a typically uh, a typical response function uh, as a function of the load that is normalized with a maximum value. And like this, we can see that again we cannot convert more than. 25% of the power that we saw previously also because here I'm just considering the electrical, uh, the electrical equation so that means I'm skipping the, the, the mechanical part or, or in other words I'm considering that the coupling is very low so that there is no modification of the displacement or the temperature difference. And uh, if I want to use the energy here I should be I should be in this range in order to maximize the energy that I'm harvesting. But maximizing this energy here, we didn't consider uh, first. We didn't consider rectification. Usually, when I want to uh, power an electrical device, I should provide a constant voltage, and then I should also provide a constant voltage at a within specified range. But first, I have to provide constant voltage. So what I have to do is rectification. How to do the rectification? It's typically using a bridge rectifier. For example, here, a full bridge rectifier. How does it work? Actually, uh, when the piezoelectric element voltage, the absolute voltage of the piezoelectric element is greater than the rectified voltage, we have a conduction uh, of the rectifier bridge. And we have charge flow from the piezoelectric element to the harvesting stage. For example, here we have storage stage with a smoothing capacitor in one direction or in the other one, but uh, because of the rectifier bridge, on the, on the last stage it will always be in the same direction. So how to uh, investigate the power we can harvest here? Actually, if I'm, going, if I'm considering the end of uh, of one harvesting event here that, happen, that uh, actually occurs on the minimum displacement, so when the displacement 
equals, let's say, to minus un, with un being the magnitude. Then here, I have the rectifier bridge that is in open state. So that means I have no current flowing from the tube electric element. And if I'm looking at the equation here, no current, so that means the voltage derivative is proportional to the displacement derivative. So that means that the voltage varies with the displacement. Of course, because it's non-linear here, I cannot use uh, Fourier series or Fourier series. I can, I, can, I can use Fourier series because it's periodic, but I cannot easily use harmonic representation. It's easier to consider uh, time domain uh, resolution. Uh, so here I have uh, the uh, expression between the rectified voltage and the uh, displacement magnitude. Then I'm looking at at what displacement there is a start of the next harvesting process thanks to the resolution of this equation here because here being an open circuit we have voltage and displacement that are linear, they are not proportional but they are linear. I can uh, therefore compute the next conduction starting uh, time or equivalently conduction starting displacement U1 when I'm here and then I know that the harvested energy over one, one uh, harvesting event is the charge that has been transferred times the uh, voltage. It happens two times per period, so at the end I can have the power, two times the frequency because I have two harvesting events per, per period, and then uh, the uh, voltage times the transfer charge, and I have something that is quite similar than previously with an optimal value of the resistance that is, however, not the same as previously. And more particularly, if I compare AC and DC systems, ah, if I compare AC and DC systems, the harvested power in DC is a little bit lower for low coupling than uh, AC one. But again, what we did here, both for AC energy harvesting and DC energy harvesting, is that we consider that the displacement magnitude is constant. So that means we, did, we didn't take into consideration the coupling. But what happens when we have higher coupling of the piezoelectric material? You can see over the piezoelectric structures, or pyroelectric structure, but usually to take into account the coupling, it's more in the piezoelectric case. You can see as a function of the resistance and a factor of merit given by the squared coupling coefficient by the mechanical quality factor, that we have this kind of saturation here. So that means it's not interesting to, to increase the coupling coefficient of the material or the structure, or to decrease as much as possible the coupling, because it won't help in terms of power. Uh, it, will, it won't increase uh, the, uh, it won't further increase the power. Okay? The same happens for DC case, but we can see that DC case, this kind of plateau in terms of powers uh, arises later, and we can see that DC in terms of energy harvesting for low coupling case is a little bit lower than AC case. So why uh, we are considering this figure of merit? It's quite interesting because this figure of merit, again, it gives quite nice idea in terms of global because it takes into account the structure with the mechanical quality factor. The mechanical, mechanical quality factor may be more or less linked to the available mechanical energy and the mechanical energy that, have, that can enter in the structure. So the vibration energy should first enter into the mechanical structure. Uh, and then the squared uh, coupling coefficient, electromechanical coupling coefficient to know how much of this uh, mechanical energy that is available can be converted into electricity. Okay, so again, here we can see this kind of global, uh, global approach that says, and uh, which is also consistent with the previous presentation, it's uh, not that useful to have very high electromechanical quality factor because we won't have significant gain or even we won't have Gain, uh, any gain at all in terms of harvested energy. And on the other one, it will be costly, uh, it will be huge, big, things like this. Okay? 
So this is also something important to have in mind. So we see that we have been seen that there is uh, optimal load that increase that uh, that maximizes the harvested energy. So what we want to do is to be at this optimal load. But if I'm considering my electrical circuit I have to supply, the circuit can be either in slip state, so consuming very small power, or, no, or, or uh, in other words, having very high equivalent input impedance. It can be in sensing state, where it consumes a little bit of power, so maybe on. Uh, so, up. Can, I can take this as an example. So, slip state, very high equivalent impedance. I can have less, no energy if I connect it directly. Uh, no power if I can uh, if I connect directly on my micro generator like this. Medium state, you can say for example here, for example when the system is sensing. So here, yeah, I yeah, have less, a little bit of energy. RF communication state, we, where uh, we have typically a few milli to tens of milliwatts, milli amperes of uh, consumed current, of supply current, and we have so uh, very small equivalent input impedance, and so we have here we have less no energy. And considering that uh, most of the time, with the further uh, discussion we had previously. We are in slip state, so that means very high equivalent resistance. Most of the time we won't harvest energy. So we have to find a way so that the circuit, whatever the uh, supplied circuit uh, state, we are the, uh, the transducer, the piezo equipment material, or bio equipment material, will see this impedance. So how to do it in order to have kind of decoupling of the uh, circuit I have to, uh, to supply and the piezoelectric element. So to do so, we'll use a discontinuous uh, operating mode uh, converter. Uh, so it's typically switched converter that are, are in, uh, in discontinuous mode. Either AC-DC converter or DC-DC converter. One of, uh, there are many classes of uh, possible converters the uh, typical one being uh, step down, boost, bug boost, or flyback. But uh, in most of what is interesting here, in, more in all the cases, is that usually we have usually a transfer of the, electrical, the electrostatic energy available in the piezoelectric element into electromagnetic magnetic force on an, uh, in an inductance. And then this electromagnetic energy is transferred to uh, capacitive uh, capacitance or storage. So that means we avoid, some uh, with some of the architecture, it's not possible, with other it's possible, but we avoid a direct connection, energetically speaking, from the piezo to uh, the final energy tank. What we want to use is kind of intermediate energy tank, and what is well uh, suited for uh, the capacity of electrostatic energy on the capacitance is electromagnetic energy in an inductance. So this is what we want to do with uh, this system, is actually to ensure that the piezoelectric element is to ensure or to try to have the piezoelectric element not directly connected to the load. And among the four architectures here, the bug boost is actually one that permits this because we have, uh, I don't know, if, uh, no, we don't have it, but we can see that first we are connecting the piezoelectric element to an inductance. So we have charge transfer uh, from the piezoelectric element that uh, would be current in the, in the inductance with the diode that is blocked. So we don't have any connection, direct connection from the piezo to uh, the load. And then when we open the switch uh, here, the, uh, the, the inductance will discharge its energy into the storage stage. So like this, we can have a total decoupling from the piezo to uh, the resistance. And actually what is nice is uh, that 
the, uh, the load that will be seen by the piezo under some circumstance, and the steer circumstance being the discontinuous operating mode. So with this equivalent load seen by the piezo electric element, totally independent to the uh, final load, or in other words, the, the states of the electrical circuit that, they, uh, that is uh, connected at the end. So in this part, how does this particular example works? So as I said, first, with the rectification actually, first I'm closing the switch. So here it's, uh, the switch is only a transistor. So I have the piezoelectric element that is actually discharging in uh, the inductance. So the current actually increases, the piezoelectric current increases and is equal to the current in the inductance. Then, once I did that, after uh, a given time, I open the switch. So the piezoelectric element will be in uh, open circuit, and there is no current that, uh, that flows from the piezoelectric element. But and I still have a current in the inductance. And uh, you know, in other words, I still have energy in the inductance. This energy has to go somewhere, this current has to go somewhere, and actually in this case the diode will conduct and will have the inductance that is actually discharging in the load. Okay, the storing capacitance, here it can be for example uh, rechargeable batteries and so on. So this is what we have. The piezo, the, um, sorry, the inductance is discharging in, uh, the, uh, in the battery or the load, and this is also what we have here with the battery current. So in this case, you can see that the piezo is never connected to the battery. This is uh, why the piezo, uh, the uh, load seen by the piezo is totally independent to what I have after. As long as here I have this third step, that means all the, uh, all the energy stored in the inductance at the end of the first uh, step is transferred, so that means the current eventually cancels before the uh, start of a new, uh, new process. Okay? And when doing uh, some uh, evaluation of the uh, impedance seen by the piezoelectric element, for example taking the average uh, rectified current, we can see that the, uh, the load, equivalent load of this world system, including here the rechargeable battery or the system to supply, will depend on the inductance, the switching frequency of the switch, and uh, the, duty, uh, the duty cycle, but not on what is connected after. So that means we can tune this value to be here, and whatever the state of my uh, circuit, my piezo will always see this value, and we will harvest the maximum power, minus some lossito. So we can either have a DC operation with a kind of a buffer capacitance or AC operation without any buffer capacitance. Both of them are working actually. Maybe I will go a little bit further, uh, quicker, sorry. Uh, here it was an example on how to implement it. Uh, let's say uh, if you want can be, it can be a whole box. And uh, how actually you can see here that we have another voltage source. This voltage source, of course, it's, uh, it's uh, meaningless to have, to put a battery for an energy harvesting system to harvest energy. So it can be directly powered in the, uh, in the DC case especially, it can be directly powered by the energy, uh, let's say the um, buffer, the energy in the, the buffer uh, energy tank, so in the buffer capacitance with some uh, very low power uh, oscillator, for example, this uh, oscillator here the, uh, that is manufactured by microcrystal, uh, it, uh, it's uh, typically a sub-microwatt oscillator, so very, very low energy. So then, uh, other examples, not here, what we have, we don't uh, accept MPPT, maximum power point tracking, why I didn't why I didn't uh, uh, I have not uh, exposed MPPT? 
because MPPT, to my opinion, it's well adapted when we have a certain amount of power. It's starting to be quite difficult in micro scale system or let's say in centimeter scale system. Uh, usually we need to have efficient MPPT. Uh, we need a uh, lot of uh, computations. Uh, we need uh, some algorithms and so on. And uh, when we are counting every uh, microwatts or microjoules, it's quite difficult to have significant gain with MPPT, even if it's, I would say, it's not impossible, but I would say most of the time it's, uh, it's better to have uh, something totally open loop, uh, sensorless, in order to, uh, to be as efficient as possible in terms of energy harvesting. But what we have in terms of commercial example, we usually we don't have any, especially at very at a small scale, we don't have uh, power adaptation, but what we can use after is actually uh, power conditioning and more precisely voltage regulators in order to be sure that after we have kind of um, kind of a uh, fixed voltage at this is at a required level by uh, the sensor and the, uh, the world system we want to pour after. Uh, but this we need to put it after actually the uh, load adaptation. The load adaptation ends at harvesting as much as possible while uh, these uh, voltage regulators aim at uh, shaping the voltage as required by the connected IC after. So, final part about the energy extraction optimization. So, up to now, uh, what we saw is how to, uh, how to be at the maximum, uh, at the optimal load to, uh, uh, to get the maximum power for a given structure, and how to uh, shape uh, the electrical quantity. But actually, for, and we will see that it's especially suitable for low coupled system. If I'm looking at the, if I'm going back to the model again, but in this case, the mechanical uh, part, mechanical equation, of the equation set of my blood model, and I'm doing an energy balance, an energy analysis, because I need the mechanical uh, side, I multiply by the velocity, and then I have the power, so I do an integration to get the energy. We can have here the uh, energy entering the system. Here we'll have more or less the uh, variation of uh, the kinetic energy, variation of the potential energy, energy lost. And the last term is quite interesting. It's actually the converted energy over the time period of interest. And you can see that this converted energy makes intervening both an electrical quantity and the mechanical quantity with an electromechanical parameter. So this converted energy is actually the energy that is available for harvesting, for extracting. So this is another way to increase the, uh, the power output, is to increase the energy that is available on the ketoelectric element. What we did previously is just to take most of this energy, but how to increase this energy? Actually, we can consider this particular term. And when we are looking at this particular term, we have two possibilities. If I consider that I have a fixed vibration, we'll take the case of uh, high coupling after, but low coupling, u dot, so the velocity is fixed. So how can I increase this term? Two possibilities, either I will increase the voltage magnitude, or because I have this integral effect, I will reduce the, uh, the time shift between the voltage and the velocity. Okay, if I'm doing uh, integral of uh, sine times cosine, I won't have a lot. But if I reduce the time shift, I can have something much higher. This is what we can do in a purely semi-passive way. In here, what I'm calling semi-passive is that we don't have any voltage or current. So any, we don't have any electrical source in this, uh, in this system. What I will do is just switch it playing with some switches. For example, here, when I have maximum voltage, or minimum voltage, that is actually maximum electrostatic energy because we have a square, I will have the piezoelectric element, an inductance, the piezoelectric element, 
being more or less a capacitance, uh, we are having a capacitive behavior. I have something that starts oscillating around zero because I don't have any other voltage sources. And if I manage to open it after half of this electrical oscillation period, I have voltage inversion effect. Then I open it for the next step. So no, I, uh, because the switch is open, I have no current. So no current, that means voltage and, uh, and displacement varies in the, vary in the same way. Until I reach another maximum of the electrostatic energy and I will do the same. So you can see that we have this kind of uh, inversion effect that actually allows cumulative process with a significant increase of the voltage magnitude. So we play, we are gaining with the first term. But also if we are looking at this kind of uh, piecewise constant function, it's, uh, it's also in phase with the velocity. So we are also gaining with the second term. So if I will gain both terms with this approach, it's voltage increase and phase uh, the reduction of the phase shift without any external energy except maybe controlling the switches. And if I uh, will quickly go uh, to this, I uh, will just stick to the results here. I can put this switch either in parallel with my piezo and the uh, rectification and harvesting stage, okay? And like this, actually, well, I, would, uh, I can also take into account uh, the, uh, the uh, damping effect. Well, I won't go into the detail of, the, of these equations. And I can also merge, if I'm looking at also something else that can be interesting, sorry. Here, I have an inductance. But what we did previously here for the load adaptation is that I have also an inductance that will be used as a, as a intermediate energy tank. So why not combining these two? That means discharging on the inductance when the electrostatic energy is maximum. Okay, so this also permits to combine both the the, uh, the energy, uh, the energy uh, available energy increase and the load adaptation. And this is what we can do here with the same architecture than previously, except that here we have a kind of synchronized in a charge transfer with uh, the voltage. That means we are only transferring the charge when the voltage is either minimum or maximum. I don't, I'm skipping all the theory. Just to show you the final graphs. So here we have the two possibilities uh, with directly using the switching system. So we can see that we have a huge increase in terms of, uh, in terms of output power, uh, a little bit less than one decade. While for the last system we saw, when we combine both the load adaptation approach and this nonlinear switching system, it's a little bit less. It's, uh, let's say, 3.5, uh, but it has the very uh, interesting property of being theoretically independent from the conductive load. Okay. So uh, it's a matter of being between very high gain, but we are not sure we are the optimal, the optimal value of or uh, having a gain that is a little bit smaller, but we are ensured that uh, we are harvesting well. Now if I'm taking into account the damping effects, because we saw this, this kind of co-design taking into account, for example, the structure, we have also to take into account the bidirectional aspect. And what we see, globally speaking, is that for low coupling, the, uh, the, the nonlinear approach allows to have significant energy gain, while for high coupling, they don't provide any further enhancement, and sometimes, actually, they can even decrease the power. But what is nice here, actually, is that with some electronic tricks, we can use a material that is really bad, and so really cheap, to have the same performances with a material that is that have very high that has very high performance and therefore that is very costly. 
So we can see that with uh, electrical aspect, we can more or less having some uh, compensation of uh, material aspect and structural aspect. Material aspect with the coupling coefficient and the structural one with the mechanical quality factor, for example, which allows actually going towards, for example, uh, micro generator with a lower cost. So they said, so nonlinear switching interface are quite well adapted to low to moderately coupled systems, so moderately coupled and or uh, with a moderate uh, mechanical quality factor. And so it's, it allows to uh, shift this kind of, uh, of uh, power curve. Some implementation uh, quickly, very quickly, because I'm running out of time. So uh, basically what we want to do, what we will do uh, for maximum value, for example, is that we will delay a little bit the feather voltage with uh, here a filter. And we can say that we have a maximum value, the same for the minimum except that we are inverting uh, the two uh, terminals, here that we have a maximum value when the delayed voltage is higher than the original one. And then we can trigger comparator that will therefore close the switch uh, that is played by a transistor. So uh, let's go to a summary. So uh, we have seen first the motivations behind the energy harvesting. So that are primary uh, the limitation of due to the battery leakage rather than the uh, initial uh, energy stored by the battery. And how to uh, address this through the energy that is surrounding us. What are these these uh, this energy sources and how to convert them? Uh, so we see, for example, that uh, generally heat vibration and solar energy and conversion effects are quite interesting. But again, it's general consideration. Uh, the choice of the energy source and conversion effect has to be driven by the application and the applicative environment. Also, uh, it's not only a matter of energy harvesting, but also of energy use. Uh, for example, it's totally useless and actually counterproductive to, uh, to over-design the system. Okay? Uh, careful, uh, careful attention should be, pla should be placed on the energy balance. Okay? And also that a global approach is necessary because we typically have bidirectional coupling between each block and so if we want to come to make an uh, optimal system we cannot combine blocks that are, uh, that are optimized separately at the end it will be so the global system will be suboptimal so that's very important for this global approach so in summary having a global approach that is application driven most of the project I have recently it's not on energy harvesting, it's on self powered system because when I submit a project on energy harvesting, it's not funded. When I submit a project with self uh, on self powered system with energy harvesting part, it has higher chance. Don't, I don't say it's automatically funded, of course, but it, I have higher chance uh, that is, uh, it's, uh, it's fast. Actual challenge in energy harvesting, it's actually the, uh, to ensure that we have enough available energy, so the incoming energy in the transducer. Then how to enhance on the global aspect the conversion, so taking the most without killing the source. To adapt the load, even if we saw some, uh, some example. And in terms of mechanical energy harvesting, vibration energy harvesting, there is still uh, some uh, stuff to do even if there has been some research, for example, on nonlinear mechanical structure or uh, self-adaptive mechanical structure in order to have high frequency bandwidth or kind of frequency adaptation. Then we have seen the uh, electrical interface basically dividing it by uh, into three interfaces. The first one to ensure that the, the transducer sees the optimal load to maximize the, uh, the power. Then how to, uh, to ensure that uh, it's, can, it's, uh, the voltage is compatible with uh, the circuit to supply. So in this case, we can use commercial ICs that are quite mature. And finally, if uh, required, how to artificially enhance the, uh, the, uh, the coupling and the conversion abilities of our transducer by some electronic tricks. 
And uh, finally, uh, we didn't have uh, the occasion to make some simulations, but it's also important to to remind that theory, simulation, and experiments that are typically the three ways for analyzing the system, they have both their own advantage and in um, drawbacks, uh, especially simulations. Uh, sometimes simulation gives you uh, really uh, inaccurate uh, results, and it's sometimes quite difficult to see that uh, this results is inaccurate. So uh, about simulation, it remains a tool that does not uh, that does not uh, substitute uh, experiment and uh, theory. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Hope uh, give you some. Uh, good